Good afternoon, and a warm welcome to this uh, policy dialogue organized by the European Policy Center in cooperation with the Polish Institute of International Affairs to discuss about a pandemic that changed the world and a conference that promises to change Europe's future. How are the two events related and why should it matter? This is, in a nutshell, the brain teaser for today. So on the one hand, we have the coronavirus crisis, which has upended, upended society, creating more leeway for change than, than history normally concedes. Some of this change has been truly traumatic in terms of the scale, speed, and socioeconomic impact. The response was not always correct or sufficient. Everywhere and at all levels, mistakes were made. But then, in many ways, some of the change has also been bold, unprecedented, and even breathtaking. Science and technology play the key role in this regard, allowing people and economies to adapt, to innovate, and ultimately to survive. We are still at a stage when, where there is bad news and there is good news all at the same time. Yet, at least in Europe, we can now afford to worry not just about the present, but also about the future. We can begin to dare to think of a post-pandemic era and how it might look like. Indeed, we feel compelled and justifiably, so I would say, to assess how the coronavirus can serve us to optimize our ways for a safer and better future. So now, what should this necessary self-reflection process focus on more exactly? What are the main reforms and priorities that we should contemplate henceforth? What old practices should be cast away and where should we innovate and experiment more? Who should participate in these conversations and who should decide about these issues? To what extent can the Conference on the Future of Europe help us start to navigate this new brave world ahead? To address this and other questions, I have a stellar pa panel of speakers lined up for you including Nicoletta Pirozzi, head of the EU Politics and Institutions Program at Instituto Affari Internazionali, Yolanda Zimanska, head of the European Union Program at the Polish Institute of International Affairs, Daniel Freund, member of the European Parliament for the Group of the Greens European Free Alliance, who will be with us shortly, uh, Goran Fonsido, director at the Swedish Institute for European Policy Studies and Yanis Emanuelidis, Director of Studies at the European Policy Center. I'm very grateful to our speakers for making time to contribute to our discussion here today. Thank you. As always, we will first hear from our panelists and then I will turn to our audience and invite our participants to ask questions and make comments live or in written um, as, as you prefer. And I would like to start uh, from Mr. Fonsido. According to um, a recent uh, special Eurobarometer survey carried out in October, November last year, amidst the second wave of the pandemic, six in 10 Europeans say that COVID-19 crisis has made them reflect on the future of the EU. And this is the majority opinion in most countries, except the Netherlands, Denmark, France, and Finland. Would you agree that the pandemic is kind of a wake up call for us? And why would you say that, the, that Northern Europe seems to be somehow at odds on this point with the rest of the EU? Well, thank you very much and thanks for this kind invitation. I'm very much looking forward to taking part in these discussions. Now, I realize drawing from your question and the invitation that you asked me to be a bit of a, a cool wind from the North putting some limits to the uh, excitement about the upcoming conference and perhaps uh, add, uh, asking for some modesty as to what we can expect. And obviously I will do my best <laughs> in this, in this uh, part, but uh, just to say that I think of course, personally, that there are great opportunities involved in these exercises as well. But I, I also say that from the point of departure of pr prior experience, when it comes to these future oriented conversations about European Union, such as the convention period in the early 2000s, the experience at that point uh, was particularly in the country I know most, Sweden, is that high flying uh, rhetorics and uh, ideas about the future of Europe, issues of institutional division competences, 
are not easily, do not sit easily with a public debate with citizens in countries uh, like this. Rather, the idea would always be, and is already in the line, in the build up for the conference on the future that we're talking about today, would be rather to have a conversation with citizens that is focused on results, about pragmatism, about solution, finding solutions to real problems. I mean, the critique, the obvious critique of such position would be that any discussion about substance is related to how we do things that the procedures on how to decide on political matters will have a substantial impact on also the outcomes of decisions. And I think that is true even more so when we're talking about European Union affairs, as it often becomes a question of the division between, between the institutions and how we, how we organize our decision making. Nevertheless, I will, I will try to say three small points, general points uh, uh, on this broad topic that you have presented to us. The first one relates to the impact of the COVID-19 crisis, which is of course a very broad topic and I'm not going to suggest to make assessment of how the EU has done so far. But just one point is that of course, health policy and all the measures taken to, to, be, to fight the pandemic has been very much focused on the member state level. And that has to do of course with the division of competences, but also I would say that all of these measures that are very far reaching, far reaching and unprecedented in peacetime Europe, it's also natural that they remain within the level of decision-making where it's easier to hold to account so that executive powers can be held to account for the measures they've taken in the, in the, in the fight of the coronavirus. And that is, obviously the case when we talk about how to hold, hold to account at the supranational level, which is possible, but perhaps more difficult. On the other hand, or at the same time, we know that those measures taken by member state, they also have a profound impact on neighbors and the functioning of the EU as such. And therefore the EU has done quite a lot to handle these situations throughout this year. And looking then to the future, one would obviously think that issues of health union competence would be natural in a con conversation about the future of the EU. I would think that many Nordic or Scandinavian Swedish politicians would argue that, look, we actually did quite a lot during this year at the EU level to fight the pandemic. So it's well possible within the framework that we have that you can improvise and actually achieve certain results. So there is no need to at this stage engage in wide ranging discussions about treaty revisions, et cetera. But I still think this of course will be and should be an important topic, how to build our societies resilient, how to act together and et cetera during the crisis after, after the pandemic. Now, the other topic is of course related to the things that have happened during this year that also should play part in a, in a conversation about the future. And that has to do with all of those things that are not done by the noble book today, that we should have a conversation about how to do it tomorrow. And that includes issues such as the rules on state aid, the fiscal uh, regulations, the macroeconomic policy framework, and from a frugal, frugal perspective, the future would be also very much determined on how the next generation EU package is actually delivered and what it means for the future of the EU. From the frugal perspective, the normal point of view will be to say this was a one-off and that how it should stay. Beyond that, I mean, there are a number of things that also were not resolved during this year and that possibly a side effect of a crisis year that are important and I think from a Nordic perspective should be included in any discussion here. That is of course migration, that is cl climate change, that is the EU's place in the world. But I think perhaps most importantly, the issue of rule of law, fundamental values and the democratic backsliding. Any conversation about the future of the Europe from, this, from our perspective would need to include a serious discussion about this. Final point I want to make is more related to the conference as such. And that is not a, a very original point of view, but the first one is of course to manage expectations. Manage expectations that are different from the actors involved, be it member states or other institutions or actors, but also perhaps on the participatory level to manage expectations of the citizens who are to be the prime actors in some respect in this exercise. How to engage with citizens with an open-ended process such as this? What is the purpose, etc.? I think that needs to be 
thought about a little bit more in detail. And on a related note, I think once you activate methods of participatory or direct or deliberative democracy, one should also think about it in the context of representative democracy and to make it as a functioning complement to representative democracy rather than as a, as a, as a, as a total exchange for, the, for those mechanisms. And I, I emphasize this because, I mean, really representative democracy today in Europe is a bit under pressure. There is pressure coming from both technocratic uh, critique, there is from the populistic critique, but there is also the problem of representative democracy finding its way in, in European affairs. And I think it would be bad if participatory elements or dialogue organized in the context of the Conference of Europe will be taken as an excuse for political parties who are key bearers and intermediaries in our political systems to shy away from any discussions about European issues. Because that's really where I think we need more of functioning representation, more of debate that goes well beyond this year long exercise. And just look at the Eurobarometer you mentioned uh, before in the question about the best way to ensure your voice being heard by decision making makers at the EU level, the number one item picked by respondents would be still to vote in European elections. It's about 55%. And in the country where I reside, Sweden, this it's at the top level of this, uh, of this uh, survey, it's 87%. So what I'm trying to suggest is that we already have, you know, our dem democratic structures. And it's very important that we try to work with those structures and that the representative democracy in parties and elections function well beyond this very exercise. And I will stop there and I look forward to listening to you all. Thank you so much. I think uh, you raise very important points. Um, of course, there are quite big differences um, um, among countries with the extent to which uh, they still have trust in uh, politicians and elections uh, or uh, um, uh, faith in European Parliament elections for that matter. Um, but I, um, I, I think you, you, the, 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 um, the point you make is very interesting, and I hope it will come up again um, um, from other, from the other speakers and in our discussion. I also um, note uh, the the agenda for the future that you've outlined to us, which is quite busy, um, almost as busy as uh, the one that the conference seems to be putting forward. So uh, that will be another. Um, uh, interesting uh, topic to delve in. And speaking of the content of the conversations that we have for the future, um, since we've mentioned this Eurobarometer survey, um, Europeans see um, in, 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 uh, in, in this uh, poll uh, issues like climate change, terrorism, and health related risks, but also uh, forced migration and displacement as the main global challenges uh, for the future of the EU. So I would now like to turn to uh, Ms. Zimanska and ask her, how do you think that our priorities have changed from be before the pandemic? And what would you say that um, are the legacies of the COVID-19 that should preoccupy us now from now on? Um, it would be especially interesting uh, to find out from you uh, the Central Eastern European perspective on this question since we've just heard a little bit the, the Nordic one. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will start my intervention by saying that, in my opinion, over the years, over the recent years, the banner of the conference on the future uh, of Europe has been heavily used. As part of the process, a number of meetings and consultations were held and often not leading to specific conclusions. And the scope of the topics covered has changed also with the emphasis shifting from planning structural reforms to defining development priorities and reforming sectoral policies such, uh, such as climate and uh, digital policy. Due to uh, the pandemic crisis, um, uh, um, I mean, pandemic can be considered as a turning point for the conference, not only because of the topics uh, that need to be taken into account, but also 
uh, taking uh, into account um, organization of this event. Um, pandemic will for sure uh, hinders the involvement of citizens in this debate. Um, what will make really difficult um, uh, to conduct this process. And uh, in my opinion, it's of course, uh, at the same time, difficult to expect that this new edition will bring a breakthrough in the work of this conference. The lack of consent uh, to interference in the treaties limits also the project ambitions which will mostly like, likely reduce um, the interest in participating in this conference by uh, representatives of civil society and experts. And despite this limitation, um, I think the process of reforming the EU will continue uh, and the crisis is an impulse for further integration, especially in the area of health policy or building Europe's economic sovereignty. In this context, the Conference of Future of Europe will become not so much a forum for initiating reforms, but rather for consultating decisions uh, with citizens. And um, when it comes to Poland and the Central uh, European region, um, I can say that Poland has a set of well-defined priorities that the government has been promoting with the V4 countries for a number of years. And among those priorities, we have completing the single uh, market through elimination of remaining barriers for free movement of services and labor in, particul uh, in particular. Um, this is considered as vital for a quick rebound of um, European uh, economy. Uh, Poland will also uh, call for just green and digital transitions, stressing the necessity to ensure adequate EU support for states, uh, for which this process may be particularly challenging and costly. Uh, the government will also continue uh, making a case for uh, closer cooperation in tax matters um, aimed at fighting tax uh, aviation. Uh, Poland also insists on the benefits of continuing the enlargement process and keeping and deepening ties with um, neighborhood countries. Institutional reforms, which were very um, important in this first edition of the conference um, are not seen as a priority. Uh, Poland and also the V4 countries uh, are skeptical about the majority of proposals that have circulated in the European Union, such as more qualified majority voting or trans transnational lists in European elections. And um, uh, the fact is that the, given uh, the time and organizational framework of this conference, um, so it's in fact uh, less than one year of discussion, uh, Polish government does not expect the conference to yield proposal for far reaching reform of the European Union. This process, this conference is rather seen as an opportunity for the institutions and member states to listen to the citizens and um, adjust existing um, policies according, uh, uh, accordingly, especially that uh, some of um, reforms related to um, green transition and digital uh, transition may be uh, costly for citizens and influence this um, citizens' perception of the European uh, integration. Uh, I think I will stop now and uh, be happy to, um, yeah. ask, uh, to, to answer your further questions. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, your, your, your final point uh, links a little bit to the question of managing expectations that uh, Mr. Fonsido um, 
raised uh, earlier. And um, maybe one follow up question would be to um, to ask whether you think we're doing a good enough uh, job at um, um, explaining to, to, to the citizens we want to engage the extent to which uh, uh, this um, uh, this conference is going to uh, to change a lot or uh, simply um, offer a forum for uh, for discussion. Ms. Zimanska? Uh, excuse me, uh, could you... Um... You said that the conference is not going to, to, to change a lot. We're going to simply discuss existing policies um, uh, with, with citizens. Do you think that citizens are aware that this is the only goal of the conference or do you think uh, they expect more? Are we doing enough to explain to them um, uh, the purpose of this uh, initiative so, that, so as to manage the expectations? Uh, yeah, well, I think uh, it's really difficult for me to say how other governments act in relation to this conference, but the Polish government is promoting the, uh, the event. So um, at least for now, uh, the main involvement of the government is uh, the promotion of, um, of the discussion. I know that and actually when we uh, look uh, in the organization framework, there is not such a huge space for government. Uh, in this edition of the conference. It's more space for national parliaments um, here than for governments. So um, there are some, um, uh, uh, some initiatives and events already planned uh, by the uh, national parliament, Polish uh, parliament, um, uh, that will um, involve citizens. Uh, but, you know, uh, as I mentioned, it's a very short time, uh, a huge spectrum of topics that we need to touch and a very unclear uh, goal at the end. I mean, um, we um, still don't know what the conference should bring, uh, in fact. That's why I think that govern uh, government and parliament also in Poland and think not only in Poland, but also in other countries, they are watching uh, and uh, the, the, the process and reacting uh, accordingly somehow. Uh, uh, but the main purpose, um, at, at least as I uh, read the intention, uh, is to, to build this link between the European institutions and citizens, not um, uh, uh, not a link between governments and institutions. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, the scope for intervention here for national institutions is quite limited mm -hmm. uh, this time. Uh, yeah. We don't have any uh, debates in parliament uh, mm, uh, made by the leaders and so on and so on. That's why I think it will depend on, um, uh, on uh, institutions, European institutions, how the uh, 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 conference will look like. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Nicoletta, we've heard from the previous speakers that um, uh, different member states approach uh, the future uh, differently. And of course, uh, the pandemic as well, uh, we've seen that has exacerbated differences in preferences and interests among the, um, the EU countries. At the same time, European citizens believe that greater solidarity um, among uh, the member states would be one of the most helpful developments for the future of Europe. To what extent do you think that it is possible to, to accommodate growing differentiation within the Union? And, um, and could the conference help us to this end? Thank you, Corinna, and thanks for the invitation. Thanks to ETC and PISM for this uh, event. And um, I will address your question. Uh, but I would like also to start with uh, some considerations about the conference itself and uh, possibly a view from Italy uh, on the process to complement also what was uh, said by the uh, other speakers. Um, so as we all know, we uh, are starting one year late than expected with this conference. 
And uh, of course, the conference was a victim of the COVID-19, but was also the victim of a tough interinstitutional battle uh, on the name of its president, on the uh, timing of the exercise, on the expected results. So now uh, we have finally a governance for the conference, even if this is not the most effective one, uh, because it is quite complex and it will uh, uh, operate by consent. Uh, we have an idea of the timing, so the exercise should be ended by the spring of 2022, even if the European Parliament is not convinced this is the uh, best way to proceed and there should be maybe a follow-up process leading us to the next European elections. And then the main thing, we are not sure about the expected results because uh, we know that the plenary will take stock of the outcome, uh, include everything in a report that will be presented to the presidents and each president will act on the basis of its or uh, own, comp own, own uh, competencies, um, while the council has ruled out uh, completely the possibility of a change um, of a treaty reform as an outcome of the conference itself. So view from the point of view of Italy, does it make sense to invest uh, in this conference uh, politically and to consider it as an opportunity? Um, I would say yes, for at least uh, three main reasons. So first of all, this is still an exceptional opportunity to create uh, a public space where citizens can discuss about their expectations and also their preferences about the future of Europe. And I think this is very much needed because in the last two decades, the citizens have been affected by many crises. And the majority of these crises have been dealt with either in a technocratic way or behind closed doors by national executives. So I think that also due to the COVID-19 experience that we all have, it, it is really time for the institutions to open their doors and to make citizens really involved and protagonist, protagonists of the uh, future construction of Europe. And there is a specific challenge here because the challenge is to uh, really channel the grassroots pressure that we uh, know is there for a renewal of the European Union into a constructive process of dialogue and not to leave that not to leave it at the mercy of the eurosceptic and populist forces which are increasingly presenting themselves as the uh, you know the true interpreters of change and these instances by the European citizens. And this is particularly true for Italy because we experience a dramatic fall in the confidence in the institutions in the first uh, phase of the pandemic, due also to the lack of solidarity at the uh, initial stage by other member states and new institutions. But the situation has changed after the adoption of the next generation EU. So I think we should really take advantage of this and use the conference. Second, and connected also to your question, I think this is really an opportunity for Italy to put forward some proposals uh, that Italy has been promoting for a long time and which could be put under the citizen scrutiny and hopefully also relaunched and adopted by the institutions. Uh, I'm talking about um, some uh, transformation, for example, in the debt sharing mechanism and including the, in the next generation EU to uh, hopefully turn it into a permanent instrument. I'm talking about the creation of a tax system of the European Union through the introduction of new resources, but also talking about new mechanisms within the European Union. So for example, the proposal to have uh, an extension of the qualified majority voting to overcome stalemates as the one we have just witnessed on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the Council, but also to put forward a new perspective of Europe, including the possibility of a differentiated integration among member states, leaving those member states that want to go forward in the integration path to do so in the best way possible. Uh, of course, this will require to turn the conference into a real constituent phase for the European Union and demand that the results are taken into consideration duly by the institutions.
So if there are reform proposals, this should be addressed either by legislative proposals by the European Commission or by an open process of reform of the treaties if this is the case. Third and final point, I think there is also a matter of political opportunity. Uh, because on one side, we will have uh, President Macron, which, uh, uh, who will have uh, every interest to use the outcome of the conference uh, in the best way for the next uh, presidential election. We already have a position by Angela Merkel, which spoke uh, in favor of uh, um, the conference leading to concrete proposals and not excluding a reform of the treaties. And then on the other side, we have a, a group of 12 European countries, including basically the countries of the New Anseatic League, together with Austria, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia and Malta, which um, put forward a position that excludes binding obligations coming out from the conference and also rule out a treaty reform process. So I think it is very important for Mario Draghi's Italy for the time being to um, take a stand side with uh, France, Germany, and all the other countries that want to uh, be protagonists of this process and renewing a strong commitment for a more democratic, uh, more, integrated, uh, more in integrated European Union. So I think the conference would be a fantastic opportunity in this regard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicoletta. Um, one thing you mentioned um, is that um, for Italy, for, for, for the Italian uh, politicians, it doesn't make much sense, and government, it doesn't make much sense to invest in this initiative. And you've outlined a number of, um, uh, of reasons. Uh, it's a position which uh, mirrors a little bit what we've heard, heard also from, um, uh, from, the po from Poland. Um, and so I want to bring in a question uh, that links to this point that comes from one of our participants, uh, Mikhail Ribaki, who is saying, well, how can we persuade European citizens to participate uh, in a conference if you, um, that explicit, um, no, in, in the conference, if you explicitly say that we shouldn't expect any far reaching changes even before we have really started to discuss anything? What's the incentive for an average European to participate in a listening exercise that can't yield any tangible results if politicians are not convinced? So. I'm combining a little bit uh, uh, Mr. Ribaki's uh, question. I hope he will excuse me. I rephrased it a little bit, but I think that he addressed it to, um, uh, to uh, Ms. Simanska, but I think it's relevant to what you've said as well. Yeah, absolutely. I see a clear challenge uh, connected to, to this issue, uh, the issue of, ex of expectations. I think we went already too far in presenting the conference as an opportunity for citizens to have their say about the future of Europe. And going back now will be a real boomerang for the European Union. As I said, I think this is really the time to engage citizens in a meaningful exercise. In order to have a meaningful exercise, we have, to, uh, we have at least leave the door open for a, a real reform of the European Union in terms of its competencies, in terms of its uh, democratic mechanism, and also in terms of its policies. If we don't do that, we will say to citizens that we're just open to listen and maybe possibly in a future uh, point, uh, take these into consideration without a clear commitment. I think this is not the way to go. And I think that's why some uh, of the political leaders have already envisaged a different outcome for the conference itself. On the other side, I think that if from the citizens arrive a clear request for an um, important reform uh, in the European Union, it will be not possible for the institutions mm -hmm. to disregard them. And we will have to figure out how to address them. As I say, treaty reform is not the only way. Uh, it can be uh, the way to go if uh, we have to implement some reforms. In other case, there could be uh, a legislative initiative by the institutions but we have to make sure that what citizens want is then transformed somehow in a reality of the uh, European Union. Thank you so much. 
um, Mr. Freund, I come to you. Um, we've we've already started to discuss about the conference, um, uh, and the comments are on the critical side uh, so far. So um, maybe you can help us understand why is this conference relevant? What do we want with this conference? And why now? Uh, why at this particular point in time? Is it well-timed, if I can say so? Well, thanks uh, for, for the invitation. I'm glad to participate in this debate. Uh, I mean, we in the European Parliament, and me personally, we have wanted this conference for, for a long time, right? We, we have advocated, we have fought for it. The Parliament, with a large majority, voted its position uh, a year and a half almost ago now. Um, so this, this was all pre-corona. Uh, we, we already thought this, this was needed. And, and our analysis was basically that the union has gone through crisis uh, for, for 10, 15 years now, uh, Euro crisis, migration, Brexit, and now Corona is adding sort of, you know, the economic fallout of that is the fourth uh, crisis we go through in, you know, a decade and a bit. And time and again, we see that there are structural issues uh, of the union. The, the, the union is not in a shape today to respond to the big challenges of our time. Uh, it lacks the competences, it lacks the resources, it lacks the agility, it lacks the, uh, the capacity to act uh, on, on, on many of the big issues that, that we're facing. Uh, we as politicians see that. I think citizens have very clearly realized this as well. And so the question is for me, and, and you know that then comes to the question, am I hopeful for this conference or not? Um, in, in, we, we all realize that, that reform is necessary. And, and in a way, I think on a number of issues, we can basically make two choices, right? Either we say, okay, we, we don't want common solutions. We want to go back to, to national solutions because we think they are better. And we wall ourselves in and uh, as, as tiny countries face uh, climate change or taxation of large corporations or, uh, you know, facing China on the international scene, whatever it is, or we say we want to, we want to do those things together. That's, that's what I think is, is the better approach. And, and I think quite honestly, to many of these challenges, the only approach that that can work, because what are all our tiny member states going to do against China, against Russia, uh, you know, to defend human rights or, or basic values in the world or whatever. Um, so, so then if, if the solution to this is we have to, to work on integration, we have to overcome uh, vetocracy, unanimity voting in, in foreign policy, uh, for example, as was already mentioned, well, then that needs to be addressed. It needs to be discussed and we need to build the political majorities for, for the necessary changes. And whether that includes treaty change or passerelle or legal changes to a law in a, in a way kind of doesn't matter. And I wouldn't open the debate with citizens on, but have you done your legal study on how exactly you're gonna do uh, that thing that you want? It's not how you talk to citizens, right? Um, but, but, but then for me, the, the risk of disappointment is infinitely larger if we admit the, the EU cannot be reformed. And quite honestly, the big challenges of our time, the EU will never be fit to address them. Be happy with what the union can deliver today, but anything more than that, forget it. That's not what I want to tell to citizens. So I think the risk of disappointing them in the conference that we cannot fix all the issues of the union in, in 12 months, um, you know, is, is smaller than not even trying uh, at all. And, you know, I know that there is a risk. Uh, I'm quite confident, uh, you know, that we can achieve something. And if it isn't immediately at the end of the conference, well, then at least we have had the debate, we have outlined that. And I know that I will go into the next European election saying, well, we got a clear message from citizens on, on, on their ideas of reform. And that's the platform I'm running on. And anyone that disagrees, well, that's up to the voter to decide what, what they want in the European elections, but of course, also in the national elections, because we all know that some of the, the biggest hurdles and the biggest uh, opposition we're gonna face from national governments, right? Uh, um, so, so in that sense, the, the conference is also an opportunity 
uh, for us as members of the European Parliament to, to build alliances with members of national parliaments, a forum that we don't really have in, in, in the current structure. There is COSAC, but I have been, and it, it's not a great forum. So I really hope that the, the conference plenary is a, is a way different way of organizing us. I'm, I have great hope on you know, us sitting together in, in political party caucuses with my colleagues from national parliaments, with the uh, few colleagues that I hope uh, national governments will send, well, green colleagues uh, in, in national governments that will also be there. Um, so, so I think that can, can, can bring some change. Uh, just two more more comments quickly before I finish. One is, I, I think with Corona, we actually have learned something already from the past crisis because the Corona Recovery Fund is a different reply than the one that we gave to, to the financial crisis uh, 10, 10 years ago, right? So, so there is some learning, even if it's slow. Um, and, and the question is, are we further going to learn? Are we going to uh, perpetualize uh, the, the common borrowing and investment in, in to our future, given the enormous challenge of transitioning our societies and our economies uh, to, to climate neutrality, um, you know, is so much bigger than a few billion over the next few years. So, you know, that's one of the questions I think the, the conference needs to look at. Um, the other thing that I want to mention on on the on the whole area of health union, because obviously, because we are in, you know, the the ebbing out of of a global pandemic. I hope uh, we are on the ebbing out and and uh, you know vaccinating ourselves out of this global pandemic. Um, health is is an obvious thing to look at, but I'm not quite sure yet. When when people say, okay, we need to look at health, what actually are the projects uh, in the area of health? That, that we would like to put forward because I haven't really heard a, a very convincing proposal of this is the one thing that the union really lacks in, in, in terms of replying to, to, to the next pandemic or something. I mean, sure, we can talk about a common uh, procurement agency for, for medical equipment and, and vaccines and stuff. I'm not sure that's really exciting uh, for, for any citizen to, to talk health procurement. And when, when we look at what might actually be needed, if, if we want to preserve travel freedom in a pandemic, uh, you know, we have seen the very different responses in terms of uh, the severity of lockdowns and, and the rules and stuff. This is why, why borders, including in some cases, you know, travel restrictions within countries have appeared. In Germany, the reply now was that we uh, nationalized more of this from, from the from the state and, and local level, but I'm not quite sure, you know, the, the logical step then would be if we really want to protect Schengen, then those kind of rules had, would have to be set centrally, you know, a, a common threshold that we agree on when does which little county go into lockdown or something. But at this point in time to discuss that the lockdown is imposed by Brussels, I, I think is, is is, is not the right moment. And, and even a convinced federalist uh, like myself, I, I, I would warn against having that, uh, that debate. So, so I'm not quite sure what under this umbrella of, of health we would really be uh, d d discussing uh, quite honestly. And then I'd say the three issues that I think top of the agenda for the conference, how do the European elections in 2024 work? Uh, how do we overcome unanimity? And uh, how do we fund our common tr transition to, to climate neutrality. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Freund. I mean, you started by saying that the politicians uh, know that the union is not in a position to, um, uh, to face uh, the challenges uh, that uh, uh, we have for the future. Uh, there's a lack of competence, resources, agility, and so on you've mentioned. So if the politicians already know what the problem is, why don't they act in response to the problems uh, and in the spirit of representative democracy as Mr. Foncido uh, said at the beginning um, and, and in that framework which we already have why do we need to bring in now citizens in the context of, uh, of a conference? For, for, for me the conference is not a listening exercise and I think I mean I am a politician all I do all day is interact with citizens, with interest groups to hear what, what people want. We, we do that all the time. I 
can't speak for all other politicians, but I know a lot of us uh, do, do this. What this conference is about is having a European conversation on, on solutions to our common problems, because way too much our conversations about this are still national. Even, our, even European election campaigns are still far too much, uh, you know, 27 election campaigns. So the reason I think these randomly selected citizens assemblies are for me really the core and the innovative part of, of this conference is, you know, getting citizens together and deliberate together on, on European solutions is a very different thing. You know, if you discuss how do we deal with migration with citizens from all 27 countries in the room is very different than, you know, some Italians or some Hungarians sitting among them and discussing how do we as Hungarians or how do we as Romans, uh, you know, see that issue of migration. And, and I think having a European debate uh, about this is, is something different. And then the other answer to this is very clearly for me, the conference is a tool that hopefully exposes the, the majorities that are already there among you know, European parliamentarians, national parliamentarians and citizens, and that we hopefully with the help of this conference ultimately can overcome some of the blockages that we see at the national uh, government level. Thank you so much. Um, Yanis, last but not least, um, I, I, I wonder if we can go back a little bit to, to, to the pandemic. Um, as grim as, as, as this crisis has been um, and, and, and still is in, um, uh, in, in some parts of the world, is there also a silver lining to it? How could coronavirus crisis open the way for progress uh, in your opinion, in Europe, of course? Thanks, Corinna. I'll try to address your, your question in a second, but let me start with a more of a general remark. Um, because in the beginning you said COVID-19 has changed the world. And I agree. But then, then you said the conference of the future of Europe might change Europe. I don't know. And I think nobody of us can now say whether this will be the case or not. We do not know what the final outcome of the conference will do, be. We cannot assess what the dynamics will be throughout this year. Yes, it might not be a long time, but there still can be dynamics which we don't even think of today. Um, and I think one can be very critical of, you know, of the process of how things have been set up, how we've got to the point where we are now and be very critical and mention all the challenges and the problems. But I don't think that we should go along that, that, that avenue. We do not have many opportunities at a national and a transnational level to discuss about the future of Europe. Um, so this is in many ways an opportunity which is given to us, which we should exploit. Uh, and we should try to make the best out of it. And actually for those who often say, you know, I don't trust that the conference will actually deliver any big results. We're not allowed to do this. We're not allowed to do treaty change or whatever. My response is always is, well, if you actually care about these things, invest it to the conference and try to make the best out of it. Now, again, we do not know what will be the end. And even when we get to the point where the conference will have ended, there will be a future after that. So as Daniel will, was saying in his position, when he then goes to the, uh, into the EP elections, he will take things out of the conference and also make his campaign based on that. Um, so there's a future, political future after the conference. And I think we should use the best out of it. Um, but let me get to the to some of the things which you to the question you raised and mention three points. Um, some related to uh, content and the other related to process. I think if we put ourselves into the situation where we were before the COVID-19 crisis uh, started, I think many of us, and I was among them, um, agreed that there is a need to have a more fundamental debate about the future of Europe. Not about the finality of the European project, but about concrete issues which need to be dealt with. And I think that's an important lesson we take from previous um, from previous discussions which we had, where we often concentrate on the finality, which at the end didn't move us anywhere. Uh, but if I compare it to where we were before COVID and where we are now, I think and that has come through also from comments from colleagues, it is that the conference actually now matters more than it did before the COVID-19 uh, crisis hit us all in all its multiple dimensions. Um, and one dimension is the health dimension. So I would think that the Conference on the Future of Europe needs to talk also about 
the health dimension. It needs to talk about what are the lessons learned of what we've gone through over the past year, one and, eight, one and a half years. Um, how much cooperation do we need? Uh, what are the core lessons with respect to how we manage the crisis? How can we improve in order to prepare for the next pandemic, which all of those who are experts in the fields are telling us it's just a matter of time. And I don't think, by the way, that, that that much means that we need to have a fundamental debate about competences, about who does what. Um, I think it's, and, but it's, it should be more than to use a word which Goran used, it needs more than being to improvising uh, for the next health challenges, which is ahead of us. Um, so it's not about transferring competences, it's about making sure that we prepare ourselves. And I think that's also something which citizens are asking us to do. And by the way, as a side remark, and I think that sometimes we're underestimating this also from a Brussels perspective um, and from an institutional perspective, there is, I think, on the ground, a lot of negative sentiment with respect to the last phases of the crisis, the health crisis, of how it has been handled. Um, and the question of you know, the vaccination procurement, how things went wrong or not went wrong. And I know it's a complex story, but we need to tell that story to people. We need to have that discussion because I think that it is already having a very negative effect. And I think it will show itself also in polling about the European Union, which is ahead of us. Second point, um, which relates to the fact that I think that the COVID crisis has made the conference more important than it, than it was before the COVID crisis started. It has, the crisis has in many ways accelerated existing trends. I think this is something which many of us agree to. And I think that the, what the conference should do, it should concentrate on those issues where the COVID-19 COVID crisis has accelerated things most. Digital transformation. We have gone through a transformation within a bit more than a year, which would have normally have taken us 10 years uh, in order to get there. There's a cultural change in which how we deal with digital. Um, and I think we should have that in mind. Green transformation. I think the COVID-19 crisis has showed that we should avoid or prepare uh, ourselves for what experts are warning us about in the field of climate change. Um, so it, this crisis has shown that we actually need to have that kind of a discussion. Global geoeconomic and geopolitical transformation. COVID-19 has accelerated the change at the global level. Look at the role of China. Look at the discussions we're having with respect to European dependencies and others. The debate we have on open strategic autonomy. These are all things, the digital, the green, and the global transformation, which the conference should concentrate on. And the fact that the COVID-19 crisis has accelerated trends, I think also creates among the wider audience a readiness to discuss about these issues. Um, but we should decide on which issues we should concentrate. Less is more. Daniel mentioned three issues which he has high on his agenda. We should have a discussion about what exactly we want to discuss about when we, just, when we deal with these transformation processes. Because I think that the conference could actually have one strong function, which is what I call the pressure function. It can put pressure on the system, on those who are in charge to change things. Corinne, you asked, you know, well, if we know what we need to do, why we're not doing it? And that is a very strong question. Um, and I think that's a question we need to address and use the conference for in order to put that pressure on the system to do the changes of which we actually have discussed for many years in many areas. Daniel was referring to all these different crises which we have gone through um, in, in the context of the what we now call it the PC, the perma crisis, because it's a, we, have, we have different chapters of one crisis and it will continue. So there are lessons which we have learned or not learned and things which we have done and things which we have not done. And the conference should be an opportunity to do that and I think the COVID-19 crisis has helped in this respect. And the third and last point is a process related point because we often hear that um, the pandemic has made it so difficult um, to, do, to, to run the conference on the future of Europe because people need to meet, they need to have real debates. And we all now hope that this will be possible after the summer break. It might be possible in a better way, but not, not in a full way. And, and I think we should rather not look at the realities of COVID-19 in terms of how we are now interacting and communicating only in a negative way. We should see it as an opportunity. We should use it as an opportunity, this culture of change which has happened with respect to how we use modern technologies in order to then use them also in the context of the conference. And I think we're not being innovative uh, enough in our, uh, trying to exploit the opportunities which these new realities, these new digital realities are providing us with in order to connect the different levels you know, trans-local, trans-regional, and transnational. There are different 
levels of transnationality which we should be where we can use these new uh, technologies and the way we are now operating with them in a much more constructive way and to give you a final example i think it is a mistake that we're not using the period of 9 may until the summer before we start uh, with the, with the european citizens panels in order to have an exchange with citizens and to ask them with a selected group of citizens, ask them which of the nine issues, if you look into the common platform, the multilingual platform, which of these issues are the most important ones? Which questions are the most important questions you want to address? And use that as a starting point also for the European citizens panels. We could have used the time and used the modern technology we have at our disposal. And what we're doing is we're not doing it. We're concentrating on what's being done at the national level, whereas at the European level, not a lot is happening. And I think that's a pity. We should use the opportunities we have much more in which technologies and which the COVID-19 crisis has given to us, not only as a challenge, but as an opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, I don't want to take any more time from the debate, so I'm going to open the floor for questions and comments from our participants. Um, Please uh, raise your hand if you want to intervene um, directly. Otherwise, uh, we have already a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, the first one is asking, it comes from Johannes Gruebel. If you see, he's asking um, whether the average uh, citizen has actually heard about the conference. Because uh, still the average citizen doesn't necessarily know about it. And also the online platform uh, that uh, was set up for the conference is dominated by the usual pro-European suspect. How can the conference live up to its own ambitions to reach out to every corner of the union and the unusual suspects? Have we done enough to promote the conference? And then we have another question from um, a journalist in Lithuania uh, Evaldas Labanauskas, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. She's asking about whether the pandemic has accelerated EU integration and uh, has changed the role of uh, the uh, institutions, European institutions. Um, those are two questions from our public. I don't see any hands up. Um, one other question that I'd like to add before I come back to, um, to our speakers links to the um, to this issue of the agenda of the conference and the fact that we have such a broad agenda and so many topics um, and i wonder how can we get uh, mr Freund mentioned the importance of identifying projects for example in the um, uh, health union uh, discussion how do we get to concrete topics if the agenda is so broad and and what do you think would be the best way to narrow that agenda and focus it on just a couple of, um, uh, of issues that can produce concrete results. Um, I'll use these um, three questions for a first round of, um, of reactions and I'll come back uh, first to Mr. Freund because he will have to, uh, to leave us in 15 minutes. Um, Mr. Freund. Thanks, uh, Corinna. Um, I mean, the question of promotion, absolutely. I mean, ordinary citizens haven't heard about this yet. Uh, this is very clear. I think there's about 10,000 people that have registered on the website. Uh, pretty much no one has followed the, the opening uh, ceremony. I heard something like 500 people uh, watch the web stream. So it's not, we haven't even reached the EU nerds yet. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that many people, even within the European movement and, you know, member of, of the European Federalists uh, so far, I'm not sure everyone has heard about the conference. So it's, it's a, it's a long way to go. How do you get people uh, into this conference? Well, one, by by signaling that, that this is serious and that something will come of it, that it's not just a complaints box that we will ignore, because why should I interact with that box? Um, and, and, and I have to say, I have some hope for the randomly selected citizens assemblies, because it is the best tool that at least I can think of. And I mean, I, among the European Parliament team that, you know, was the ardent fighter for this, I, I came up with a proposal. I uh, was the one fighting for, for this the most, because if you randomly select a, a representative sample of citizens, well, then you do get those that don't usually engage. If you just say, I'm going to hold a couple of town halls and people can come and interact with the EU institutions, well, then you get the usual suspects. But random selection uh, should bring in voices that we don't usually hear. So I have 
hope uh, that, that that actually works. Will enough people realize that that is what we're doing? I'm, I'm fighting for that. Uh, we're not there yet. That's, uh, that, that's for sure, but we all can do our bit uh, to make that better. Has Corona uh, accelerated integration? I, I would answer that with a resounding yes. What we have done with the, with the recovery fund is, is a big step forward. Uh, I hope it's it's not just a, a temporary uh, progress in integration, but that this will turn into something uh, more more permanent. And if it does, it is one of the bigger leap forwards that uh, that we have seen in, in in recent decades. And then finally, the question on a, on agenda setting for the conference, because this is the decisive issue, I would say, uh, that that is that is on the agenda right now, right? Because if, if we're trying in these 12 months to discuss everything and, and every proposal on the platform, uh, and if the outcome of the conference is a booklet of, I don't know, 300 uh, different proposals, well, then we are setting ourselves up for failure and for disappointment. Because, you know, having lots of proposals that are not implemented is just frustrating for everyone involved. So the more we manage to focus on a few key issues, uh, the better. And the better we're placed that at least on one of these issues, maybe we actually do get a breakthrough and, and something to, to, to show for at the, at, at the end of the conference. So I, I think this is, this is vitally important. Um, how exactly you do it, uh, does, you know, do, do we as those in the executive board uh, make a few proposals and then citizens pick, uh, pick their favorites among those? Or uh, will the online platform uh, in some shape or form actually allow us, you know, to say, okay, these are the top five uh, proposals from the online platform. So this is now what we're putting on the agenda. Um, we'll, we'll have to see a bit. Um, I, it's, it's difficult to predict at this point. And I also don't know exactly where, where all the other players uh, that will have a word in this um, stand, stand on this issue. It's a conversation that we haven't started yet. Thank you so much. Um, since, since you will have to leave us, um, and since there is a, another question which is specifically addressed to you, I will dare to uh, pose it to you right now. And this has to do with the risk of uh, political infighting um, uh, for the next year in the um, uh, governance structure of the, uh, of the conference. Do you think that we run that risk? I mean, I, I, I read the, the, the question, uh, are we now all on the same page? Absolutely not. This will continue to be a fight. Um, but I'm also a bit hopeful because so far, um, not on everything, but mostly the, the right side of the argument has, has won this. And let me put it this way. If, if governments are so starchly opposed to, to treaty change, if they uh, publish their joint letters, if they were willing before the 9th of May to possibly risk uh, the, the start of the conference over a fight of what competence exactly does the conference plenary have, I read that as a sign that, that they actually fear that something could come of this. Uh, that, you know, letting national parliamentarians and European parliamentarians and so on sit in the room together over a year repeatedly and discuss things, that this might just spark uh, a few ideas and alliances that, that are maybe not in the interest of national governments. Mm -hmm. So I, I would read this as a positive sign. The, this is not one, uh, far from it, uh, but, but I think there, there are some, some promising indications um, out there. Thank you so much, Mr. Frank. Um, you mentioned also that the, uh, this random selection, and I suppose that you mean for the European citizens panels, for the EU level events with citizens, but how do we, and, and that this could be a point uh, that could raise the interest and awareness of citizens into this initiative, but how about the national level? And I come now uh, back to our other speakers. Um, how could we make this conference known uh, to our citizens uh, on the ground um, in the different member states. Uh, Mr. Fonsido, this and the other questions, if you want to cherry pick and respond to any, uh, please. Well, thank you very much, Corinna, and thanks also for the other, the, the full discussion here. It's very interesting. No, I think on the first point on randomly select, selected uh, groups, I think it's, it's, of course, the right way to go, because I was pointing out before, 
one of the weaknesses of any participatory elements is that it could construct a, a political bias that actually political equality is better guaranteed or if not fully guaranteed in a, in a, representat a representative democracy because we have, you know, that's the equal right. Then the problem already exists there. We know that the right to vote is not equally exercised within, uh, within our uh, countries. And, and that plays out very well also in the European elections, as we know that with lower turnout, those differences become even starker uh, as, com as when it comes to our political capital or uh, be it in other ways. So I think, of course, this is the right way to go about. Now, the question you asked is then, how do we organize this at the national level? I still think there is a, a risk of, of a selection bias in the, in the way that those who are engaged in these discussions will sort of make up a certain part of society. And that has to do, I think, with this relation, the connection to what then, what's the purpose of the exercise? Because even though we know from, from surveys, for instance, the Eurobarometer, nine out of 10 think that citizens' votes should be more heard when it comes to deciding and discussing the future of Europe. But then why, why should I do it? What, what sort of context should I engage? And I think this is a major challenge for all those organizing national debates or transnational debates. And I would strongly just support this idea that this is, if something, it's an opportunity to not keep it as national debates, but rather as transnational debates, an opportunity to organize events whereby politicians or others, actors from various countries could for once, once we can travel, visit each other's countries and engage with citizens, not only with their peers. I think this, this could be one alternative in order for us to learn more and to understand what Europe looks like from our respective perspectives. Now, I'd like to Sweden just... Uh, so. Will really? Sweden do so? Well, I, I, I don't, I think here, I mean, the, the basic idea is really to organize it as a bottom up and, and actually even before the conference, there was, this is part of, of the way in which EU matters are organized in Sweden, that we put a lot of emphasis on active participation of civil society, of citizens, etc. And I think this work will be, we continue. But the question is then, what do you do in those participatory events? If it's a dialogue whereby ordinary citizens can ask questions to leading politicians, I would be a bit critical to call that a proper dialogue in a sense, because then, then you're asking someone responsible to give an answer to a certain question, uh, and the responsible person gives an answer, providing his idea, his or her idea. It's not really the way you would think of a proper, you know, properly functioning deliberation or participation in that sense, connected to some sort of tangible outcome. And that relates to the question that Daniel Freud also talked about, about the agenda setting. I mean, this is, this, I see this as a dilemma in a sense, because either you think of it as clearly bottom up, then you should not have a predefined agenda what the topics are, but then you run the risk of this being a discussion about everything and nothing. On the other hand, if you have, you know, let's say politicians in one way or another, pointing out the key issues that we should discuss and open up a discussion, then it's very much a top down exercise after all, Again, you know, so I, I, I clearly see this dilemma and I'm not quite sure how to best how to best do it. But I think this one need to really think about this in order to make it uh, as appealing as possible for citizens to actually actively take part. I mean, we know they can do look at the referenda over EU uh, matters. That's a mobilizing effect when citizens know there is something at stake, they will mobilize, they will become more knowledgeable and they will vote <laughs> sometimes against the, the will of, of, of their respective elites. But that's, uh, that's also when there's something at stake, uh, citizens will mobilize. If there's less at stake, you have to find new ways, I think. And, and this could be a very fruitful exercise if, if done properly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there a risk that, uh, that um, we won't arrive at meaningful results because uh, there is no clear guidance, standardized guidance for how these national events should be organized? I don't know if um, any... Uh, okay, Yanis, um, please. Yeah. Let me say something about that question, but also address the point which Daniel raised with respect to which issues should be the ones which will be discussed in the, in the conference proper. With respect to um, creating attention for the conference, I think from the beginning, we had a strong emphasis on the European, the transnational dimension. There was the right thing to do. 
this is which makes also this exercise very particular is also something which we need to further develop in the future. But I think at the same time, we should have devoted the same attention to what's happening in the member states. Whether we want it or not, debates are predominantly happening at the national level. That doesn't mean that we should only have national discussions, but we need to have national discussions about issues being discussed in the context of the conference. And then we also need to transnationalize them. We also need to translocalize them, transregionalize them. So we need to do that, but we also have to have discussions at the national level. And we've put a lot of emphasis on the, on the, nas on the transnational, but not on, enough on the national. I know the reasons where this comes from, because member states who didn't agree on how to deal with the conference wouldn't have been ready to agree on a set of a fixed framework of what to do also at the national level. So now we left it to every member state to do whatever they think they want to do. That was a mistake. I think we should learn from that with respect to the future. And maybe we can also do something throughout the process of the conference to counter that mistake, which we have done. Um, also because the results of discussions happening at national level, well, in this way, we, how we conduct in a chaotic way will not be comparable with each other. That is a mistake. Second point, and I think Daniel, you're right. The big question, one of the biggest, not the only, but one of the biggest question now is how do you get to the issues to be discussed in the citizens panels and then in the, in the, in the plenary. And I think less is more, the that principle I think is correct, even though it might not allow the bottom up process of leaving everything open in the air when you start the process, I would have said, let's try to find a way to concentrate on what we actually believe to be the most thing, important things to deal with. And that's why earlier I, I said, and I've been saying this for a while, why don't we use the initial period of the conference in order to get together a group of randomly selected transnationally uh, citizens to discuss what they believe are the main priorities. If you look now at the uh, multilingual uh, platform, you will see it's European democracy, climate change, Europe in the world, and digital transformation. These are the four top, top big topics. So if we have your, four European citizens panels, are these the one that the issues they should deal with? I'm not sure. I would have wanted to ask from now until September, a group of randomly selected citizens meeting online, we cannot meet in real, of what they think are the main priorities. And not only that, what are the main questions you want to address with respect to these priorities? That is a big difference. We should be careful not to make comparisons to the convention, but in the convention, at least, we had the lock in agenda. We had a set of questions which had been put together. By the way, it was the representative dimension which had not shied away to do that, that, that step. Now we're shying away from doing that step, which at the end, could prove that those who don't want the conference to make a difference, that help them for the conference not to make a difference. Now, I know that there are different positions in the European Parliament um, and that that's some of the, and as you said, this is one of the most contentious issues, but I think we should have tried to find a way to get there and to use the time we now have, a, have at, our, at, our, at our disposal, not to start from zero when we go into, into the European citizens panels. Yes, Mr. Friend, do you want to respond or should I move on? It's yeah, up to you. Just very quickly, that I mean, obviously, this is something that we're just about to to start discussing, at least among the, the European Parliament delegation. And I want to introduce one one further dimension into this agenda setting question, because you know it's 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 one issue to sort of identify those projects or issues where we think th there's something winnable there, because we need a success at the end of the conference, right? For this to be a success. On something, there needs to be a breakthrough. Also, for us then to say, okay, this worked. Let's do that again. Uh, kind of argument. So, you know, part of the agenda setting is that identify winnable issues, and I think part of the agenda setting is to to generate attention. Um, I, I think you can use topics to 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 draw in attention. If we set a debate on migration, and we put Salvini into uh, into the conference plenary, and he should defend his idea of how migration in, in Europe should work. And, uh, you know, a convinced federalist uh, puts his idea against that of, of how this should be done. I think this is something, you know, maybe not a winnable issue, this one, but but a debate like that, or, or bring in Orban, I'm happy to discuss with Orban uh, about the rule of law or something, you know, then you have a debate that I think can can generate attention for the overall conference. People realize this is mm. happening. 
there's actually entertaining debate taking place there. And this might just create the, the necessary attention that you then need on an issue that if you go out to citizens and ask, how should transnationalists work? They, you know, who cares? But but it allows us to make progress on an issue like that um, uh, as as possibly one one of the winnable issues of, of the conference. And I think producing that kind of mix, attention and winnable, uh, is is um, is what we have to deliver. And if if on top of that we can do it as a bottom up, e even better. But I, I wouldn't necessarily waste the the opportunity of the conference if um, if, if if the platform does not deliver that. That that's a bit the uh, the issue that I see. Thank you so much. Um, how do we um, do we square this? This, this bottom up and top down dilemma that uh, Mr. Fonsiro mentioned. Um, um, I, I know, Nicoletta, that you wanted to come in. Uh, maybe you can uh, pick on this question as well. I don't know. Thanks, Corina. Uh, yes, I mean, this is one of the uh, challenge for the conference. Um, and I think that the two dimensions should go hand in hand. In particular, I see a specific role for the um, citizens' panels, which are some way organized uh, from uh, the institutions. And there, I think we can put on the table some of the topics that cannot be avoided if we talk about the future of Europe. Namely, for example, your democracy, uh, climate change, it was mentioned, uh, health, uh, social rights, uh, security, uh, migration, and so on and so forth. But on the other side, we have to um, make sure that the uh, bottom-up dimension is uh, duly taken into consideration. Now, I think that uh, um, there was uh, an initial mistake in the process of uh, developing uh, the conference. Um, and this mistake was done in terms of engagement of uh, civil society organizations, which felt somehow left aside of this uh, process, which is very much focused on the institutions, very much focused on the uh, parliaments uh, at national and European level, um, less so on the uh, civil society role. While I think uh, the role of civil society organizations, but also, for example, political political parties, associations, and so on and so forth, will be crucial to organize this uh, bottom-up mobilization. And also the only way we have, uh, uh, beside the uh, randomly selected citizens, to engage on the ground uh, the average European citizens. Then, of course, this bottom-up uh, um, process bears the risk to address whatever topic that the citizens feel it is important for their future. But I think it is okay. I mean, we need to um, encourage this kind of discussions because in the end, it will be in the hands of the citizens' representatives and in the hands of the institution, to, in institutions to translate these expectations and preferences into to concrete policy reforms. This cannot be the role of the average citizens. Nevertheless, we have to take into consideration the perspective and the direction uh, indicated by the average citizens to transform it into a future of the European Union. Thank you so much, Nicoletta. I'll bring in at this point um, the one brave participant who's raised his hand and wants to come in with a question. Uh, Mr. Lapinski, would you want to pose a, your query now? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Great, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very much interested in this debate and it's a great discussion. Thank you for that. I, I want to organize a debate within the conference on the future of Europe myself with my organization, Klub Jagielonski. Maybe multiple debates, we'll see. Um, now, my first question, they are both related uh, to each other and I'll, I would address them to the whole panel. Uh, the first question is how do we overcome the resistance um, from the national capitals on uh, substantial changes in law or treaty change? So for example, I'm very much interested in the um, uh, change of the tax regime that, Ms. that Mrs. Szymanska had mentioned, but I, I do not know how do we overcome the, the, the probably expected opposition from, from Ireland, Luxembourg, so on and so forth, maybe, maybe the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. My second question is, um, 
if I organize a debate, how do I convince uh, uh, people that are going to be participating in it uh, that it's not just a um, mood discussion? Uh, because my assumption is that with so many voices, so many debates, the voices that are most, most likely to be heard are these that are already confirming what uh, the Commission and the Parliament have already uh, made, the, made, made their minds up on. Thank you very much. Right, thank you so much. Uh, to this, I'm going to add a couple of uh, other questions we've received in written so that we can go back for final comments and, and responses from our panel. Um, and we have a question from uh, Melissa uh, Julian asking, how do you see the discussion on migration evolving in the conference? How can citizens and organizations ensure that comments from citizens are more evidence-based, particularly given the importance of the use of the conference in future European elections? And then we have a uh, question from Teodora Pampriketsi from EPC. Um, he's, uh, she's asking um, about the rule of law issue and democratic backsliding, if this is to become um, a, a subject of the conference, how can we make progress on these issues? I think this is, she's addressing the question to Mr. Fonsilo, but maybe uh, Ms. Simanska can also uh, touch, touch on this. And finally, maybe a question uh, from myself, because the, the German elections have been brought up. I don't know if Yanis disagrees or agrees with Nicoletta's assessment of how um, the, the, this election will uh, be linked and impact uh, the, the, um, the conference, but we also have the, um, uh, the, French, the, the French elections, so the French and the German elections, if you have any comments uh, about them in relation to the conference. Um, I will start maybe from from Yanis. No, I will give the floor first to Ms. Dimaska because she hasn't spoken in the first round of questions, so uh, she's waited too long. Please go ahead, Ms. Simonson. Okay, thank you very much. So let me first touch the issue of migration because I researched migration for a long time already. And, and I think that, um, of course, answering the question how to involve citizens in this discussion is very difficult, especially taking into consideration that the debate among the European leader um, is uh, all the time postponed um, and after years of attempts of exporting this problem um, to a European neighborhood. Now we are avoiding, I mean, the European leaders are avoiding this um, sensitive, uh, politically sensitive topic. Um, but I think it's really high time to um, start this serious uh, discussion. We have a new um, proposals from the European Commission published in um, September uh, last year. And it's high time to start this discussion because uh, first, um, the level of migration is now much lower than in 2015. So discussion, um, shouldn't be so hot so it's now better time to discuss uh, discuss the uh, longer perspective and uh, uh, show also the positive sides uh, of migration not only this um, uh, 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 better uh, a, a humanitarian crisis that was related with the migration in 2015. Um, and I think that also a pandemic uh, and uh, uh, a crisis of Schengen zone, restrictions on borders um, and shortages uh, in labor during the pandemic that we experience during the pandemic uh, may also um, be used as an example uh, for the Europeans that um, migration is not the challenge only, but also uh, the opportunity. Uh, that's why I think uh, we should connect the idea of um, uh, forced, mi I mean, the, the problem of forced migration with the problems of um, uh, the common market in the future, the labor market in Europe. And um, here I can uh, see some positive effects of the pandemic that may be used by politicians in 
uh, translating this uh, problem to uh, the society. Uh, so this is the, the, the first uh, point. How about the rule of law? I think that the rule of law is um, really um, detailed and uh, complicated issue. I think that although this issue is addressed uh, to uh, Poland uh, among the others, uh, it's not uh, easy uh, to understand uh, by um, uh, citizens although they are affected somehow by reforms uh, of judiciary system and so on and so on. Um, uh, that's why I think this uh, issue must be rather discussed, uh, not by citizens, uh, by, uh, but by the uh, uh, European politicians and, uh, and European institutions. It's simply um, uh, too, too detailed and too complicated, I think, to, uh, to easily uh, uh, conduct this discussion with, uh, with citizens. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you much. so much. Um, Mr. Fonsito, do you agree or, or not? Well, I think if you look at, we've talked about this, the Eurobarometer uh, poll a number of times. If you look at one of the items that is asked in this poll, uh, there is a question whereby the respondents should rank what is the main asset of the European Union. And the top item there is the is the EU's respect for democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And more than half of the member states, this is the number one item. So in that sense, I think it seems to be at least that for citizens, this is something that can engage them. Uh, but then again, what does it mean talking about it? I, for one, I think it's quite important to, to discuss these matters as this is a union founded of democracies. And I think that's one way to do this is actually to talk about what the fundamentals are. Now, if at some point you would come to uh, a situation whereby this conference indeed would lead to, for instance, treaty change, then I would assume that a, a certain number of actors would also would like to address this issue, how it's regulated within the treaties. Uh, for instance, how the voting system surrounding the article uh, with sanctions is set up. For just to take one example, that doesn't mean that you will come to a unanimous conclusion about this, but, but I'm sure that for certain actors, this will be one item if we're talking about how the institutional uh, framework of, of the union is operating. And on that, on a bit of a related note, I, I, there was an earlier question that I, I thought I might want to also say something about. It was concerning the, the extent to which uh, the EU has moved forward or deepened integration uh, during the pandemic. And then it's obviously yes, and there was a side question about what has happened with the institutions. Uh, and I think in that context, one should perhaps also think about these matters in, in, in light of the Conference on the Future of Europe, that is the functioning of our institutions. And it relates actually to the rule of law issue, where I think one should and could perhaps talk about the role of the European Council, how it operates, what the role is in, in, in our system, and perhaps also about the European Commission. And I know then, and I, I totally agree with what Daniel Freund uh, mentioned uh, several times, that citizens may not be precisely overexcited about the discussion talking about institutions, but if you link it to what actually happens when the institutions don't work properly, mm. well, then I think you already something, you have something going. And I think uh, if you look again at the polls, what the citizens want, I mean, they want an effective and well-functioning democratic union. And I think this is, should be part of this discussion as well. Absolutely. Um, Nicoletta, do you want to um, react to anything and make some final comments? Yeah, very quickly uh, on the uh, two questions uh, uh, put forward by uh, the participant line. Um, so first of all, how do I convince citizens that they really matter? I think this is really a challenge and we cannot leave it in the hands of uh, national governments uh, uh, because as we know, uh, most of them uh, do not have a specific interest in pooling uh, these uh, conferences 
governance process. So I think here the role of the EU institutions is really uh, crucial. They have to engage much, much more uh, compared with what they've done so far to uh, make sure this uh, conference is uh, highlighted and that they are ready to uh, receive uh, the proposals from the citizens and encourage the participation uh, national and local level. So I think a much uh, more effective and stronger campaign needs to be initiated, especially if we look at the results so far of the platform and the uh, starting conference. Uh, starting event of the conference. Um, how do we overcome the resistance of national capitals? I think that, uh, I mean, as I said before, this can come from uh, peer pressure, so from the position of other capitals in the EU, but especially from the citizens themselves. So if we have a critical mass of citizens uh, asking to be heard and asking for some reforms at the EU level, in the end, the capitals need to uh, uh, listen. Uh, at the same time, I think this is also related to other processes ongoing at the EU level, and here I refer in particular to the next generation EU, because this is a typical example of what we achieved um, uh, on an issue that was uh, uh, delayed for a long time, and then we suddenly discovered that was essential for uh, our existence and our future. If we can prove that this, uh, this is something that really works, then I think uh, the uh, national capitals and member states will probably understand that sometimes uh, we need to be a bit braver uh, in our decisions and uh, uh, try to build something meaningful for the European Union. Very quick point on German and French elections. Yeah. Of course, they're always a turmoil for the European Union. Uh, and I mean, this is uh, even more the case uh, on one on one side, because this will uh, put an end to the Merkel era uh, in Germany, and on the other side, because we don't know yet which are the prospects for uh, Macron uh, after the presidential election. And it is even more the case for the Conference on the Future of Europe, because in any case, this was very much an initiative led by France and Germany. Mm. And that's why I was insisting at the beginning that other member states need to join urgently uh, in this uh, uh, idea of making the conference something uh, good. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nicoletta. Yanis, one minute and a half, um, if you uh, can, um, we are already over time a little bit. Okay, uh, just three questions. Give me half a minute for each of them. Uh, with respect to the question of how do you overcome the resistance of national capitals with respect to the issue of treaty change? Well, first of all, you don't start a discussion about treaty change. You start a discussion about the actual issues which are at stake, and then you come to the point where you ask, do we, can we do X, Y, Z on the basis of the current treaties, or can't we? If we can't, then you need to provide a, an answer to that. And by the way, the, the example which was mentioned with respect to taxes, this is something where you could use the passerelle clauses from the existing treaties to move to qualify majority voting, but then you need a, a unanimity to do that. And there you see that some member states don't actually want it, but you wouldn't have to change the treaties. Second, how do you make sure that people don't only feel that it is, I'm quoting, a mood discussion in the conference of the future of Europe? And the easy answer to that is, by making sure that it actually delivers, that it makes a difference. And if you want the conference, and I'm, I've highlighted it in, the, in, the, in, in this discussion already, if you want the conference to actually make a difference, you need to concentrate on concrete issues. The more concrete it is in terms of topics and in terms of questions, the, the higher the likelihood that you will actually make a difference with respect to the conference. And then it's not only mood, mood discussions, it's more than that. With respect to the German elections, uh, as Cornelia you also addressed me uh, directly, well, first of all, they already make a difference because you now have a government in place in Berlin which is not dealing with the conference, which was different uh, before uh, or during the German presidency, especially, but also before the German presidency. Um, but you will have a government in place, most likely in Germany, which will involve the Greens, so the party of Daniel Freund. So that obviously will also make a difference with respect to issues, uh, for example, 
everything related to green, um, with respect to the Green Deal, climate change, they will have a profound uh, position on that, which will be different from the previous government. And secondly, they also have a different uh, approach to citizens' involvement. As you can hear when you listen to Daniel Freund, they have a different approach to that. So it will be interesting to see when the Greens come to power, co-power in Berlin, or how they will use these, these differences rather quickly because time will be ticking in terms to make a difference also with respect to the conference. Thank you so much. I think we've done the impossible possible to um, cover in one hour and a half two extremely broad issues, the pandemic, its impact on the one hand and then the conference. I'm very grateful. Thank you so much to our panelists for um, for their interventions and also to our participants for their patience. This is a conversation that we will continue, but only next time. Until then, have a wonderful afternoon and many thanks. Bye bye.